Welcome back to Development Book Club. Today we're continuing with King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. And we're going to talk all about today, Just the King. And this begins the second section of the book, which is really about developing a mature masculine identity. Chapter 5 of the King. The idea here is that a good generative king is also a good warrior, a positive magician, and a great lover. So these are not, you have to pick one of, one of the four of these, but they're, they should, they're all present in how to have a mature version of each of them. And the birth of the king is almost always the death of the hero, which you remember from the boy psychology section. The king of the four is the central archetype around which the rest of the psyche is organized. There are two functions of the king in its, in its fullness, in its full expression. And number one is an ordering presence, and number two is providing of fertility and blessing. So like the divine child, the good king, the proper king, is the center of the world. And the world is defined as the part of reality that is organized and ordered by the king. So sort of kind of a double thing there. Um, what is outside the boundaries of the king's influence is non-creation, chaos, demonic, the non-world is what they say in, in myth and in rituals. So ancient societies conceived of this world as being in four parts with the center being the place of the king. So the central hill or the mount, for example, the pyramids in Egypt, Mount Sinai. Israel, Mount Olympus in Greece, and in Rome as well. So in, in Jung's work, there were mandalas or wheels, which they would appear in clients' dreams and were always the healing and life-giving structures. They always signified renewal and showed that the personality was reorganizing in a more centered way, which is a positive thing, becoming more structured and calmer. Uh, the mortal king's duty is not only to receive and to take to his people the right order of the universe and to cast it in social or societal terms or form, but even more fundamentally to embody it in his own person and his own life and to live it. The mortal king's first responsibility is to live according to the mat or dharma or tao or the way. This is to say that the fish stinks from the head down. Uh, for example, uh, when we see like in modern dysfunctional families that when there's like an immature, weak, or absent father and there's not a proper king energy in the family system, the family is very often given to disorder and chaos. And that there is a, a connection between these two functions of the king, order and, and fertility. And that often in myths, the king, his ordering has a fertility component to it in, in a lot of these myths. So goes the king, so goes the kingdom, they say. And the idea here that this is the energy, the king energy that expresses itself through you when you're able to keep cool and calm when everybody else, let's say, in a meeting is losing their cool and can't keep their shit together, basically. So the, the shadow king, there are, just like with all of them, um, there is an active and a passive shadow side. So the active side to the shadow king is the tyrant, the passive is the weakling or the weak king. Uh, whenever the new is born, the Herod effect within us will take place, will attack. And this is like when Jesus was born, the king Herod felt threatened and called for all the babies to be killed. Uh, the tyrant hates, fears, and envies new life because the new life he senses is a threat to his slim grasp on his own kingship. And it's a fear-based position. He is not creative, only destructive. The tyrant exploits and abuses others, is ruthless, merciless, and without feeling when he is pursuing what he thinks is his own self-interest. And then we think back to the previous chapter, Boy Psychology, about um, gang leaders and thugs. and Yeah. Um, so he does this because he lacks inner structure, the tyrant that he is afraid, really terrified of his own hidden weakness and underlying lack of potency. And this is where all of his behaviors come from. It is the shadow king of the tyrant in the father who makes war on his sons and daughters joy and strength their abilities and their vitality he fears their freshness and their newness of uh, being and the life the life force surging through them and he seeks to kill it as a threat as a perceived threat we should say uh, the man possessed by the tyrant is very sensitive to criticism and uh, though putting on a threatening front will at the slightest remark feel weak and deflated uh, this will not be seen what you will see, unless you know what you're looking for, is actually rage or this sort of outlash. Under this rage is a sense of worthlessness, vulnerability, and weakness. For behind the tyrant, uh, 
lies the other pole of the king bipolar shell system, which is the weakling. And the weakling seeks to feel, feel his hunger to be adored and worshipped. It comes from, really from a place of emptiness. And this explains their angry outbursts and attacks on those that they see as weak themselves. Uh, that is, those upon whom they can project their own inner weakness, which is a really interesting psychological trick there. And uh, though he does not know it, what he has been seen as the face of his own hidden fear and weakness projected onto other people. So he has glimpsed that weakling within. These figures are often unable to sleep in literature. Uh, people think of, uh, I believe it was Hamlet who was unable to sleep for a while. Um, the tyrant's relationship to the high chair tyrant from the boy psychology. Um, so the children, the parents should give the divine child in their own child the right amount of adoration and affirmation so that they can let their own human child down off of their high chair easily. Now, the uh, last thing I want to talk about today is accessing the king. So realistic greatness in adult life, as opposed to in just inflation of the ego or grandiosity, involves recognizing our proper relationship to this and the other mature masculine energies. So the warrior, the magician, and the lover. Um, the, the really good image here is like a planet orbiting a star, where the planet would be you and the star is the, the archetype. The planet's job is to keep a proper orbital distance from the life-giving, but also potentially death-dealing star, so as to enhance its own life and well-being. And uh, it needs to think of itself as a steward of king energy, not necessarily the king energy itself, um, and not for the benefit of itself, but for those under its realm, whatever that realm may be. So the two shadow forms of the king can be thought of like this. The tyrant is if like one of the, if a planet pretends to be a star and gets too close to the sun, it's not going to and the other one, the weakling, is that, uh, not oh, kind of away from the star metaphor again, is that we project the king energy within ourselves onto some external person, and we give away that power that we have. We experience ourselves as impotent, as incapable of acting, and capable of feeling calm and stable without the presence and the loving attention of some other person who's carrying the king energy projection for us. This is like a, a husband who's too attentive to his wife's moods, for example, is what the authors say. Those who make our kings lead us into lost battle is what we can read. If we project onto an external person, this results into like abuse in our families, mass murder, the horrors of Nazi Germany, and Jamestown as well. That's a good breakdown of what they have to say about the king archetype. Next time we'll continue with the warrior. See you then.